Hello, my name is Gabi Buchner and I work at SAP as an author, translator and conversation designer. I'm here today to talk to you about what you need to consider if you want to make your chatbot a little polyglot. Let's suppose you are running a British fashion company with headquarters in Birmingham and subsidiaries in Switzerland. You have just launched your first English speaking chatbot which helps customers to choose a suitable outfit for special events. Maybe you are wondering if you should offer your chatbot also in German, French, Italian and Roman, since English is widely used as a lingua franca today and you also expect your typical customers to have a good command of English. However, recent studies have shown that people prefer the native language for communicating whether with other people, with websites or with apps, and this even if they speak other languages quite competently. We can transfer the findings of these studies to chatbots, which are basically a special type of software. To provide a good customer and user experience, your chatbot should speak the local language. But chatbots go far beyond language as such. Chatbots are conversation partners. And since conversations are heavily influenced by culture, it's not enough to teach your chatbot a new lingo. You also have to teach it cultural awareness and it must learn the social conventions and rules of the target locale. You might also need to tweak the persona of your chatbot a bit. Now let's have a closer look at this. Let's start with the language aspect. Some countries have several official languages. For example, Switzerland has four, but which one to use? If you build a chatbot for Switzerland that speaks only German, for example, this could annoy the speakers of the other three languages. As a company or brand, you certainly want to value and promote diversity and inclusion in every aspect of your business. Next, consider that quite a lot of countries use their own variety of a particular language. Let's take Indian and British English. Indian English has special grammatical structures, different pronunciations and unique vocabulary. It is also influenced by local languages and comprises slang words, idioms and loan words that are not found in British English. And then there are also regional varieties or dialects. To be inclusive, we might also need to consider the ethnolects that exist today. Your chatbot should cater for such varieties and differences depending on its target audience. It should also recognize typos or misspellings. If a Portuguese user, for example, is on a business trip in Germany, they might not have a proper Portuguese keyboard and will be forced to misspell words. And your chatbot needs to handle this. The next big challenge is culture. If you are lucky, you have a native language colleague in your chatbot team who knows the target culture. If not, you can use a cultural framework to get a basic understanding of what the target users of your chatbot might appreciate and expect and what not. There are several frameworks that you can use. These frameworks try to explain the norms, behaviors, customs and traditions, or even the myths and symbols that are common to a given society. Of course, we must be aware that this is a limited and also kind of stereotyping approach, but at least you can learn something about the basic concepts of the target culture. I have chosen two well-known frameworks as examples, and you can find a lot of information about them on the web. Personally, I find the distinction between high context and low context societies very useful. High context cultures rely on the context as a carrier of meaning and not just on the words itself. In other words, on aspects of communication that are not directly spoken. This means that a great deal of information is implied and not explicit. Low context cultures are much more direct and give all information that is needed to understand something. Generally, high context cultures like spoken communication Low context cultures prefer written communication. This must help you to decide if a voice assistant or a chatbot will be the better choice. The model of national culture created by Hofstede is possibly the most well-known framework in the world. It consists of six dimensions. 
Today, it is a recognized standard for understanding cultural differences, and it can help you to figure out what the target audience of your chatbot might expect, appreciate, and accept from a conversation partner, and therefore eventually from your chatbot. Let me give you an example of how people say no in different cultures. Germans disagree openly. I don't agree. French people disagree openly but politely. I'm afraid I don't share your opinion. In East Asian cultures, open disagreement is taboo. We agree. That's the way to do it in Japanese. The Swedish love consensus. We agree if all of us agree. And Filipinos show their respect for superiors. You are the boss. These different ways show you the influence of the Hofstede dimensions and the low context and high context paradigm. Now what about the people themselves? The cultural background and the social rules of a community have a large impact on how people act and behave. One aspect is people's willingness of self-disclosure. Americans tend to reveal and disclose more topics about their health and personality to strangers than most other cultures. The Japanese are very reserved in self-related topics and in some cultures it is taboo to talk about feelings. Often age and seniority play a crucial role and determine to whom and what to self-disclose. These factors might affect the dialogue flow of your chatbot, in particular as to when and how it can ask information from a user. You might need to restructure the original dialogue flow because your target audience might only be willing to share personal data later in the process. We also need to consider pragmatic differences, for example, in how people ask for information. While some use an explicit question, others use a statement in combination with intonation. Also, intonation patterns in yes-no questions can be different depending on the language. For example, the point in speech where the voice rises and falls in such a yes-no question is different in German and Russian. Those would be something to consider if you are building a voice assistant. Very importantly, some languages are much more formal than others. This includes title, address and politeness. A lot of languages distinguish between a familiar and a formal polite way of addressing people. In some cultures, like Japan, the rules of how to address someone correctly are very granular and complex because you also need to consider the status or rank or the age or seniority of the person you are talking to. Also, remember that not many concepts in our world are universal. Don't wish everyone a great weekend on Saturdays because in some countries, like Israel, the weekend is from Friday to Saturday. Other countries even have only one day for the weekend, which can be Friday or Saturday. Now let's look at several other aspects. It's also a good idea to find out if your target audience is at all using or willing to use chatbots. China has a long-standing tradition of using chatbots, especially in the consumer sector. The Japanese love to interact with artificial or fictional characters while Americans prefer human assistance over chatbots. Also have a look at the preferred input method. Some audiences prefer to type, others like to speak, so a voice assistant could be more appropriate than a chatbot. The devices and platforms that are used in a specific country or the chatting logistics and costs might also help you to decide how you can best implement your chatbot. While WeChat is China's Number one platform, Germany, India and Brazil prefer WhatsApp. For some languages, you also need to think about which writing system or script you want to use. Serbian can be written using the Cyrillic or the Latin scripts. You might need to support both to not exclude any of the two groups of users. You also need to check legal and potential compliance requirements and do a feature check to ensure that your chatbot doesn't offer or carry out anything that actually isn't allowed in the user's country. There's no proper Google Street View in Germany, for instance, and Google are face and Facebook are blocked in China. Also, some countries have much stricter privacy laws than others. Don't ask users for information that you are not allowed to get. To be on the safe side, don't use emoji. 
Emoji are risky because smileys, facial expressions and hand gestures don't have a universal meaning. The thumbs up emoji is a sign of approval in Western culture, but in the Middle East it can be vulgar and offensive. Also, the skin color of emoji can be a problem, especially in countries with people of diverse ethnicities. You should also be careful with symbols, icons and images in general. The meaning of commonly used icons in the Western world, like the shopping cart icon, is unknown to certain cultures. You should also avoid images with cultural and ethnic identity, so don't use pictures of Japanese people in China, for example. Similarly, don't use any form of humor, sarcasm, jokes, pop culture references, memes and the like. Often, these can only be understood by a specific audience. They usually don't translate well and they can be offensive, which you may not recognize. Now, you might be wondering why all this fuss about a piece of software. While this is a legitimate question, chatbots are more than just software because they act in an interpersonal context and relationship. As a conversation partner, they usually have a personality or persona which is aligned with the business context, its function, role and tasks, and of course, with its users. Let's now look at several aspects of the persona that we need to think about in multicultural scenarios, namely design, gender, name and voice. Human psychology plays an important role in conversations with chatbots. Recent studies found that the CASA paradigm also applies to chatbots or voice assistants. CASA means that we are interacting socially with computers. Closely related to this is a phenomenon which is called anthropomorphism. People tend to treat things like humans either because they like these things or because they have a special emotional relationship with them. They give them names or talk to them. In addition, we often see faces or other familiar shapes and patterns in things. Cars, for example, may look like they have eyes and a mouth. This is what we call pareidolia. Of course, what you see can be cute, but it can also be disgusting, frightening or dangerous. Therefore, the acceptance of your chatbot might depend on how the target culture perceives it. When you design a chatbot avatar, be aware of the uncanny valley. This concept was detected in 1970 by a Japanese robotics professor called Masahiro Mori. He found that the more human-like and real robots look, the more they become appealing to us, but only up to a certain point. At this point, these robots become creepy and unsettling. This is true for all fictional characters or figures and of course also for your chatbot. If you choose an animal image or avatar for your chatbot, you must know how the target audience perceives this animal. Many Europeans consider dogs our best friends, but the Quran describes them as unhygienic, so Muslims could perceive dogs as dirty or dangerous. In India, cows are sacred and treated with respect. In Argentina, beef is a symbol of national pride. If you choose a person picture for your chatbot, you must decide which skin tone it will have. In many different cultures, skin color plays a huge role in the concept of beauty. Colors are inherently neutral, but our minds and culture give them meaning. For Europeans, the color white means purity and innocence, and it's a typical wedding dress color. However, in India, China, Hong Kong, Taiwan or Japan, white is the color of death and usually worn at funerals. Colors can also be used to describe moods and emotions. And there are also differences. While the English are green with envy, the Germans are rather yellow. Now what about the chatbot's persona? One of the most important aspects of your chatbot persona is the gender. Let's look quickly at the gender distribution today. A UNESCO report found that most voice assistants are female. Chatbots are often not explicitly female, but they suggest they are, for example, because of their name or their avatar. This unequal gender distribution reinforces a stereotype of friendly women in service positions. Traditionally, we associate certain roles or tasks and also certain attributes with a specific gender. Women are seen as warm, gentle and caring and are therefore the perfect nurse, while men are seen as dominant, aggressive and independent, which makes them the perfect manager. 
Many of us have this implicit bias and we tend to bring it into our chatbots. Biases and stereotypes are also influenced by culture. In some cultures, men might not react well to a mental health chatbot with a male persona. On the other hand, a female persona could indeed reinforce the stereotype I mentioned, but also help to save or mend lives. Similarly, having female chatbots in Japan that take on more superior roles and tasks could actually help boost the acceptance of women in business. English-speaking chatbots don't necessarily need a gender because English is a neutral language. In many other languages, however, gender has a huge impact on grammar. Pronouns, verbs, nouns or adjectives have different forms for female and male speakers. This forces you to decide whether your chatbot is going to be female or male. Choosing a neutral chatbot is also not an ideal solution. Many languages don't have a neuter gender, for example, Arabic, French or Portuguese. If you want to publish your chatbot in one of these languages, you must choose a gender. Otherwise, some parts of the chatbot dialogue might be untranslatable. If you want to localize a voice assistant, consider how male or female voices are perceived by the target culture. In the late 1990s, the German car manufacturer BMW had to withdraw and reprogram its car navigation system because male German drivers weren't willing to take instructions from a female voice. The automated call centers for brokerage firms in Japan give stock calls in a female voice but confirm transactions in a male voice, so even the voice is not free from cultural biases and preferences. Let's now look at naming. It's not absolutely necessary to give your chatbot a name, but many have one because people can relate more easily with them. Which name you choose might depend on the chatbot gender, but also on the brand, the tone of voice a use case and the personality of the chatbot and the target audience. I have identified several name categories that are commonly used for chatbots. They can serve you as a basis when finding a name. If you want to keep your chatbot name for all target audiences, Consider the following. The name should sound attractive and welcoming in all languages and must be easy to write or speak. The name should not create any associations or implications in the target culture which are not present in the source culture. Similarly, if you want to use a witty or funny name, consider that humor does not work the same in all cultures. Depending on the use case, you might not only have a first name but also a last name for your chatbot. In banking transactions, this might be a good idea because a higher level of formality could create more trust on the user side. But there's also a downside with human person names. Users might believe they are interacting with a real person. You must therefore make it clear from the very start that your chatbot is just that, a chatbot. I hope you enjoyed this session and found it useful. Let me finish with a famous quote by Noam Chomsky. A language is not just words. It's a culture, a tradition, a unification of a community, a whole history that creates what a community is. It's all embodied in a language. Thank you and take care.